According to Emperor Constantine's biographer, the Bishop Eusebius, Constantine witnessed a vision before a critical battle to capture Rome from his political rival Maxentius. Around midday, Constantine saw what Eusebius describes as a cross-shaped trophy formed from light resting above the sun, and attached to it were the words, by this, conquer. Later that night, Jesus Christ appeared to Constantine in a dream, saying to manufacture what he saw as his battle standard. A different, slightly conflicting account written by Constantine's advisor Lactantius says that Constantine had a dream instructing him to paint a mysterious sign on his soldiers' shields, the Cairo symbol, one of the most widespread Christian cryptograms for the word Christ. With this new Christian symbol leading his armies, he overwhelmed the forces of Maxentius and became the new leader of the Roman Empire. Eusebius claims that this experience led Constantine to convert to Christianity, worshipping the same God whom he believed secured his victory. Constantine has since gone down into history as the first Christian emperor. But what did Constantine really see, if anything, and did it really spark a conversion to Christianity? First, some background on the battle itself. Leading up to this vision, Constantine was locked in a bitter civil war with his brother-in-law, Maxentius. Maxentius was holding out in Rome when Constantine marched against him. They met in battle at Milvian Bridge over the Tiber River. Reporting there is my friend and colleague, the archaeologist Darius Aria. Does it get more historical than walking on the Milvian Bridge? This is the location where Maxentius met his end and Constantine triumphed. This is an extension of the Via Flaminia and the first stone bridge located here was in the first century BC. Of course, it's going to be through the ages restored and heavily damaged in the 19th century. So largely what you see is a rebuild. And this is where Lactantius tells us that Maxentius face the forces of Constantine. Maxentius is going to engage Constantine, crossing over the river, crossing over to this side with his troops, and then having the bridge behind him dismantled. When he is ultimately routed, he's trapped and he has no way getting back into Rome and the rest of his supporters, his army is destroyed and he himself drowns right here in the Tiber River. Thanks, Darius. Everyone should check out his YouTube channel, Darius Aria Digs, for more awesome on-the-ground footage from Rome. So, after Constantine's victory, he erected a triumphal arch celebrating his victory. It depicts Maxentius's army drowning in the Tiber River, Constantine ironically performing a pagan sacrifice, and a curious inscription that says, Constantine won by the inspiration of divinity which does substantiate reports of Eusebius and Lactantius that Constantine experienced some sort of vision before the battle. But by the inspiration of divinity is super vague. What divinity are we talking about here? Well, the arch might be referencing the Roman sun god, Sol Invictus, not the Christian god. You see, Constantine was a sun god fanboy. In 310 CE, two years before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, Constantine stopped at a temple of Apollo with his entire army and claimed that Apollo appeared to him in a vision, prophesying that Constantine would live a long life and rule the whole world. We learn about this vision from a speech given in Constantine's honor after it supposedly took place. So most historians think that the report is accurate. Now, the Romans often associated Apollo with the sun, and even identified him as Sol Invictus himself. So even though our source says that Apollo visited Constantine, it seems that Constantine viewed this god as Sol Invictus instead. Constantine minted a bunch of coins that depict the sun god alongside the Latin word comes, which means companion, comrade, or associate. That same speech in 310 said that Constantine saw himself in the image of Apollo, meaning that Constantine and the god shared the same physical features. And sure enough, some of Constantine's coins do depict him dressed like Sol Invictus, standing side by side with the god. Later, Constantine even set up a statue of Sol Invictus on a column in his new capital, Constantinople. Although the statue is long gone, the column remains to this day on the streets of Istanbul. 
So by the year 310, Constantine viewed himself as a companion of Sol Invictus and became a henotheist, which means a worshiper of one god as superior over other gods. This in and of itself might have been a conversion of some sort, converting from a polytheist to a henotheist. Because Constantine was probably raised as a polytheist. Constantine was born in modern-day Serbia, which means he likely was raised worshipping indigenous gods from that region. Constantine's father, Constantius, was a pagan who carried out orders to persecute Christians, including destroying churches and forcing Christians into exile. His mother, Helena, famously was super into Christianity later in life, but Eusebius says that Constantine converted her to Christianity himself. The one possible bit of evidence that there were Christians in his immediate family is his sister Anastasia, which is a very Christian-sounding name meaning resurrection in Greek. This might mean that she was a Christian, but it's also just as likely that she changed her name after Constantine's conversion. Moreover, as a member of the Roman military, Constantine probably participated in the cultic sacrifices that Roman soldiers performed, including worship of the Roman emperor, state gods like Jupiter and Mars, or maybe even the cult of Mithras, which was super popular in the Roman military. So we need to study his conversion story at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in the context of his religious background. Constantine viewed himself as a companion to the Roman sun god leading up to the battle, which in and of itself was probably a recent conversion. We can speculate that this solar henotheism would have prompted him to look to the sun for inspiration or to consult religious experts to try to explain oracles to him. So what do we think happened? Well, the problem is we're faced with a historical puzzle. We have the speech written in 310 CE, that says Apollo or Sol Invictus visited Constantine. Then we have two conflicting accounts that claim Constantine saw a Christian vision in 312 CE. Lactantius published his version only a few years after the Battle of Milvian Bridge. He reports that Constantine had a private dream and painted the Cairo on his soldiers' shields. Eusebius has the more elaborate version. Constantine and his entire army see this brilliant cross-shaped trophy in the sky. Eusebius probably also means the Cairo symbol, but he doesn't mention painting symbols on any shields. Instead, according to his version, Constantine fashions a fancy cross-shaped battle standard with the Cairo symbol on it. Usually historians like relying on documents written soon after the events they describe. So, that would imply Lactantius' account is more accurate because it was written only two years after the battle. Eusebius' account, on the other hand, was written 30 years after the battle. But Eusebius claims that the story was reported directly to him by Constantine himself. So what happened? Well, historians have tried to harmonize these accounts into two main theories. The one vision theory and then the two vision theory. The One Vision Theory basically argues that all three sources are describing the same event from different angles. The only vision Constantine had is the Apollo vision in 310, two years before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Years later, Lactantius incorrectly places the vision in 312 before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And Eusebius records an embellished version from Constantine, who, by that time, attributed this vision to the Christian god and tied that vision to his victory over Maxentius at Milvian Bridge. The historian Dr. Peter Weiss is a one-vision theorist and argues that in 310, Constantine witnessed a solar halo, an optical phenomenon by the sun's light refracting through ice crystals in the atmosphere. Solar halos can form single or double rings, as well as what are called sun dogs, bright spots on the side of the sun. And in certain conditions, solar halos can even produce cross-like imagery in the sky, like this dramatic picture from France in 2015. According to this theory, Constantine attributed the solar halo to Apollo or Sol Invictus, and later he Christianized and embellished this original vision to have occurred shortly before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. I'm always a little skeptical of naturalistic theories like this, though. Weiss's argument is very well researched, and it's a tantalizing explanation for Constantine's vision. But the human brain is perfectly capable of generating its own fantastic visions without a trigger like this. So the solar halo theory must remain in the realm of speculation for now. But what about the two-vision theory? The scholar of early Christianity, Bart Ehrman, is a proponent of the two-vision theory. 
that in 310, Constantine became a follower of the sun god after getting a vision from Apollo. Over the course of the next two years, Constantine learned more and more about Christianity, possibly from Christian advisors in his entourage like Lactantius, and then, before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, had a dream that prompted him to decide that Sol Invictus was the god of the Christians. I'm more convinced by the two-vision theory not only because we have historical documents that say he had a vision in 310 and 312, but also because Constantine claims to have had thousands and thousands of dreams. Plus, something must have occurred before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, because soon after seizing power, Constantine thought of himself as a Christian and almost immediately started returning property to Christians that had been confiscated during the Great Persecution a few years before under Emperor Diocletian. In 313, he sponsored the construction of a bunch of huge churches like the Lateran Basilica in Rome, and he even granted food rations to the Christians of North Africa. This series of pro-Christian policies culminated with the Edict of Milan, a decision between Constantine and his co-emperor Licinius to legalize Christianity in the empire. In 314, one year later, Constantine wrote a letter to a bunch of bishops calling them dearest brethren and claiming to be a follower of the almighty God like them. During that same year, he set up a statue of himself holding a Cairo symbol in his hand with an inscription reading, By this sign I saved and delivered your city. Constantine also started minting coins with the Cairo symbol on it. For example, check out these medallions that depict him wearing a helmet with the Cairo symbol on it. Another bronze coin dating to Constantine's rule displays a battle standard with the same symbol on top. Coins from later in his reign depict the Christogram on shields too, an echo of Lactantius' account of the battle. Constantine also became deeply involved with church politics and theological debates. He even sponsored the Council of Nicaea, a huge meeting between major church leaders to try to mediate a debate about the nature of Jesus Christ created being, or equal to God. Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea to try to end this controversy, presumably in an effort to achieve a level of tranquility in the empire. But we shouldn't think of Constantine's Christianity as a sudden change. Constantine's conversion presumably was an ongoing process over the course of decades, and he probably didn't fully understand what being a Christian entailed. First of all, he apparently believed in a more syncretized version of the Christian God as a solar God. In one of his letters, he describes the Christian God with solar metaphors. He says that God has most brilliant beams. In another letter from 325, he writes that our great God, the savior of all, has extended the light to all alike. Moreover, Sol Invictus continued to appear on coins for years to come, and a local city government in Asia Minor dedicated a statue to him in the late 320s with the inscription, to Constantine, the all-seeing sun. Even though this was a decade after Constantine's conversion, as far as this local government was concerned, this sort of language seems to have been a proper way to honor Constantine, which may indicate he continued to be some sort of solar monotheist. Plus, he seems to have had a complicated relationship with traditional religions. There is some evidence that Constantine ordered the destruction of pagan temples and transferred money out of these temples into his own government. But at the same time, he set up pagan statues in his newly founded capital, Constantinople, including the statue of the sun god that I mentioned earlier and he associated himself with Neoplatonist philosophers. This shouldn't be all that surprising, though. We need to remember that Constantine was a savvy politician. The Roman aristocracy remained mostly pagan, so he needed to work with the imperial bureaucracy without alienating them. For example, when the small Italian town of Spello requested permission to build a pagan temple to honor Constantine, Constantine granted their request, and this was in the 330s CE, near the end of his reign, well after he supposedly converted. So Constantine continued to tolerate pagan religions well into his reign. All of this to say, conversion didn't mean he suddenly started acting like a pious saint. He acted like an emperor that would have made any character in Game of Thrones proud. He executed his 10-year-old nephew, he executed his own son and his own wife, he decimated the armies of his rivals, including his co-emperor Licinius, and he must have been making a lot of these religious decisions with political goals in mind, whether that meant 
granting permission to build a pagan temple in Spello, or sponsoring a council of Christian bishops to end a divisive controversy. Now, pagan gods did eventually disappear from his coinage, but it took time. By the year 316, Mars, the Roman god of war, disappeared. Even Sol Invictus no longer appeared on his coins by the time of 324 or 325 CE, when Constantine consolidated power as the sole emperor. All of this should illustrate how difficult it is to prove religious affiliation historically. We can't exactly read the mind of a historical figure who died 1700 years ago, especially a figure who made himself larger than life in super biased historical sources. However, even though Constantine's religious journey might be a puzzle, there's no doubt that he is one of the most important figures of early Christian history, and he laid the groundwork for the Christianization of the Roman Empire. If you'd like to learn more about Roman history, check out Darius' YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Darius Aria. He lives in Rome and posts all the time with video footage from the actual sites. He's also the creator of ancientromelive.org, where you can join online lectures about Roman history. You can find them also on YouTube at youtube.com slash we dig Rome. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.